scenes since 1996. Um, back then the police originally used to do it all for us um, and for various reasons they wanted to come out of it. Um, here we are 24 years later, everything being done remotely. Um, sort of events I've been involved with, uh, previous events, um, British Grand Prix at Silverstone, MotoGP, um, Grand National, Olympics, UCI, lots and lots of different events and genres all over the country. And as far afield as uh, Abu Dhabi at some points. Um, currently working on things like Tour de Yorkshire, um, Camp Festival, Link Show, County Show, uh, Big Festival, and uh, Lost Village, to, to, to name a few. Um, so today I just want to talk about really what, what our process is, how we design traffic schemes, how we, how we work them out, what, what's in our heads when we're going through it. Um, I'll put together a few screens here. So start off, usually get a call. What a great site I found, um, which is often a great site for event organisers, but can be a little bit more tricky for people dealing with the traffic. So what might be a great arena, um, have great views, might be an absolute nightmare in terms of sort of access points. So we like to get in early if we can. Um, access points are key for what we're doing. Good road networks are really important. Um, capacity is on site. I've talked a little bit there about how we work out that. So we work on sort of 150 to 175 cars per acre, um, 2.8 persons per car, and then we add about 10% on for wet weather contingency um, when we're working on that. So if we were working on a 10,000 capacity event, we'd require 22 acres for parking. Um, so it's just important to factor that in really from the, from the outset um, and give that added consideration. We also want to look at strategic road networks, um, local residents, you know, local towns can be an issue, um, and sort of working through that. So once we've got a site in mind and we've got an idea of what we're doing, first thing we usually end up doing is creating a, a traffic management plan. So that will come along and um, inevitably we'll end up presenting that to a safety advisory group. Um, the main thing with that side of life for us is just being prepared, it's having all our um, docks lined up and uh, you know, having a, a good traffic management plan just makes life 10 times easier. I mean, stags are there obviously to help us, um, but they're there to make sure that that event's safe and obviously highways, police, um, ambulance, emergency services, they'll all want some input into the traffic plan to ensure they can get to site safely and we've recognised that they need RVPs. Um, so that, that should be part of your event management plan from the off really, get started early, get those bits together, get it all into the SAG group and it just makes life 10 times easier once you get there. Um, and again with highways, just get them on board as early as you can really, um, they are pretty crucial. We don't know local road networks as well as say Dorset highways, so their input is really important and we like to work with them early on and get things planned um, and obviously their support going forward. So, the traffic plan itself, quite a comprehensive document um, for, for, for the size of the events. Um, so, the first thing we sort of work on is key event information. So, um, dates, times, uh, numbers on site, what the sort of event it is. Um, then we move on to sort of an overview section where we'll talk about a description of what that event is. Um, any known issues, any anticipated issues any things with residents or traffic or anything we're going to flag up early um, to look at solving. And then any prior history really, so if we've done the event the previous year, what worked well, what didn't work quite so well, and what, what we're looking to improve the next time. Um, Pre-event site traffic and TM requirements, I mean that can be quite important these days. We Some, some events now will be on site for We have builds, and it's just managing that traffic, making sure that the correct vehicles are on site and the ones we don't want aren't on site, more importantly. Um, and that we're regulating how people arrive, what routes they're taking, how they come on site, registrations, making sure we can identify whose vehicle belongs to who, if it's going wrong, how we can deal with that. Um, particularly important to get people to fill in the cards as they come in so we know what their phone number is. And then thinking, Moving on from pre-event, uh, we look at sort of advanced warning signs, so we can warn the public that there's an event going on, so we can avoid the area if we want to avoid any queues. And then um, <clears throat> other things like uh, TTROs, getting them in early applications for um, your know, road space in effect, and you need to get that booked sort of 12 weeks in advance for high-speed stuff. 
next in our traffic plan, we move on to the routing. So which way are we bring people in? What's important with that? Well, we want to avoid um, towns, we want to, if possible. Um, we want to avoid built up areas. We want to pick roads that A, can cope with the traffic and have the capacity, and B, you know, we, we're going to get people in as, as quickly and safely as we can. There's little things we try to avoid, right turns, for example, because obviously, you know, they just cause delay and every small delay ends up being a long delay. And then moving on from the, the routing, um, we'll talk about exit routes. And then we move on to sort of the actual traffic management requirements for the event. So what, what are we going to control? What junctions have we identified that might need some assistance? How are we going to assist people through those junctions? But we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. And then we've talked about TTROs, so that's temporary traffic regulation order. So if you want to close a road, uh, put a diversion on, put a speed limit in, prevent parking on the roads, all of those require a TRO from your local authority, and they normally like about 12 weeks' notice for that, so it's important to plan that in early. Um, other parts, so variable message signage, we um, roll these out more and more um, at events. These are the sort of large electronic signs that you see on the sides of the roads now, and they're, they're really crucially important to us because you can put, you know, I say one BMS is probably worth about um, 20 yellow signs because people read them. They're used to them being sort of up to date um, for the motorway network, and so they take, tend to pay more attention to a BMS than what to do with other things. Um, then we move on to talk about our signing schedules. So we need a full schedule of what signage we're putting in, who we're directing, where, how, why, um, and then obviously the maps to go with that because highways want to see where you're putting them. Later on in the document, we'll move on to our event communication strategy. So um, how we always talk to each other. Um, I mean, this sort of ties in a bit of the event control, which we'll touch on. But um, we tend to have our own radio network, because we know that will stand up. Um, we use the um, sort of cellular network radios now, because we have sites that might be seven miles, ten miles away from where we're working. So we need to maintain comms for those as well. Um, so our com, com strategy is detailed within the plan, how we're talking to them, how we're talking to event control, we've got someone in event control. Um, and how, how that's going to be maintained and managed. Um, so, hostile vehicle mitigation is a, is a, a more recent entry for, for ourselves. We, we launched a product last year um, and we just saw a need for it. Um, we've gone with um, a, a partner in the industry, so we've gone with a pedestrian permeable solution, um, which just looks a bit smarter and people can still walk through. If you need vehicle access, then we can drop that quite quickly. But we need to obviously work with counter-terrorism police, um, look at hostile vehicle mitigation requirements, what's the threat level, where are we at? We, we rolled out quite a lot at the Lumia, excuse me, Lumia Festival in Durham um, last November. So that was our first large scale install of, of HVM and it worked really well. We had some really good positive feedback. But again, it's just getting that identified in, in your plan early doors. Um, public transport links, so what are the, what are the options, buses, trains, um, I think the important thing is, um, it's often overlooked, is bringing everybody in is great, but if your event's finishing late, are there enough trains, is there enough network capacity, have you spoken to British Transport Police, have you spoken to Network Rail, you know, the last thing you want to do is sort of dump a few thousand people on the station late at night that doesn't have any trains to, to deal with them, so it's important that you get those public transport links in there. Um, park and rides consideration, um, some, some big events, it works really well, um, very much dependent, we, we prefer people on site, I, in an ideal world everybody parks their car and they walk into the event, um, but it's not always possible, so thinking about park and ride, just having a, a good bus provider who's experienced in dealing with events, um, it's quite important when you're dealing with that. At that end of the night is getting everybody in when they arrive over four, five, six hours is great, but then when everybody wants to leave, um, it, it can be difficult. And we did the um, uh, the Oasis concerts at Heaton Park in Manchester, and the first night the park and ride buses were really, really difficult on the way out, um, just dealing with the numbers of people. So you know, it's things about where, how far away do you put those buses, um, because sometimes if they're too close, they, they get over, overcrowded because being trying to force their way on. But uh, so that's something you need to consider. Um, blue routes is emergency vehicle access routes, so um, we need to provide uh, emergency services with what, what their routing is, um, ideally that shouldn't be with the general public wherever possible, 
Um, we should try and find dedicated access onto site for emergency services um, and that should be identified within your traffic plan um, so detail those routes so they can be distributed at the site um, so that they all know where they come and part of that is the uh, RVPs, rendezvous points on site so when they arrive on site what's the primary meeting point what's the secondary meeting point and if, if it's a very large event sometimes off-site meeting points as well Once we sort of into the planning phase, then we sort of liaise with um, Highways England, as they're called now, or Scotland, Wales, or Northern Ireland, depending on where you are, um, and they operate the regional traffic control centres. So it's quite important that we notify um, Highways England of, of very large events that are likely to affect their network, because they will partner with you, they will they will um, help, they will, they will even display your event advance warnings on the motorway VMS um, if, if the event's big enough. Um, so that's a really useful thing just to get that message out to people that there's a large scale event on, it's likely to cause network delays. Um, and, then, and again, they're just there, they're a strategic partnership for us. Um, and we, we work closely with them and sometimes they're in event control as well. So um, that's just a really useful partnership to have. Um, we talked about sign and schedule maps, so in the appendices of the traffic plan, um, we would include the full schedule um, and that will come with associated maps and then the CAD drawings you can see one there on screen so we work on the, the CAD drawings um, just to show what we're going to do that particular one's the Lumiere um, so there, there's lots of information contained on there the hatched areas are um, no, no waiting zones obviously we're talking about a taxi rank on this one um, park and ride pick up and drop offs we've got a um, a, a pedestrian crossing going on at the top end there um, and the associated signage. So this is everything that highways are going to want to see. They're going to want to see what infrastructure you're putting on their roads um, and, and they have to agree that ultimately. So it's, it's good to get sort of detailed drawings in. I mean, Lumiere has in excess of 100 CAD drawings, um, which I find the CAD session particularly <laughs> useful. Um, so yeah, it's uh, CAD drawings are, are all important and for, and for the people on the ground as well, so your traffic management provider, um, they, they normally provide these um, for you as part of the traffic plan. But um, it, it, again, the guys on the ground, girls on the ground, they know what they're putting out, where it's got to go, what it should look like, and it just gives you some consistency. Um, and then we talked about event control. So for us, event control is sort of the, the most important part. Being sat in the room with the event organiser, emergency services, having comms with everybody in the same room, making strategic decisions that may or may not affect other people, um, is it, key for us and fundamental to the success of an event. It's having you know, a good, experienced person in event control who understands the event, the, the traffic management plan, the car parking element, because they all tie in together. So that's sort of a really key function for us um, is event control. So I've talked a little bit about the traffic management plan, um, and that's what we detail in there. Um, moving on, I just wanted to show really what, what the common methods are, what we use, you know, what's out there, what's available. Um, things have changed a bit since the police did it. Um, you know, we moved away from that sort of uniform presence in the road. Um, so our first and primary form of control really um, is traffic signals, um, whether they be permanent, as in the picture there, um, or uh, temporary ones that we bring along and we place out on the highway for you. Um, one of the major concerns for the police when they did traffic control was safety because placing people in the highway in all weather conditions um, is, is not the safest method of control. We, we worked with Staffordshire Police in 96 onwards, developing civilian control methods, and then we um, worked nationally with APO in the following years to make that national policy, and that's when the police sort of stood back then from events and said, well, actually, the, there are more effective controls. Now, I think the main benefit of the sort of signals, um, the, the recognised form of control, everybody knows what a traffic signal means. You would hope mostly that people are um, going, going to obey what it says, um, but the point being is that they're safe in all weathers, yeah, they're safe in days, safe at night. Um, once they're out, they're out and everybody knows where they are. More importantly, the highway's operative is not stood in the road or near the road, it's controlling those lights from a separate position. Um, the important bit with the traffic lights is that they can only be installed and controlled by a super, suitably qualified operative. You know, you can't just tip off and place some traffic lights out. You need to be duly qualified to do that as two recognised common 
um, qualifications, it's the Lancer Sector Scheme 12D, or the City and Guild Signing Lightning Garden Unit 2, um, both of which are, are one-day courses. So, you know, if you're going to place anything out on the highway, even if it's just some signs of your own, you should have done one of those courses for your own insurances. Um, with us, when we put traffic lights out for events, it, it's not like roadworks, we just put them out and say, right, we're just going to let these run and hope for the best. Um, they're, they're always manually controlled at all times. So if we're not manually controlling them, there's no need for them, you know, unless it's a pedestrian crossing, um, then, then we shut the lights down. So they either on manually controlled or we take them off in, in sort of off-peak periods. Um, and then we also use temporary lights these days to facilitate pedestrian crossings because um, they're, they're quite useful because they're the push button um, and then they've got tactile buttons and everything for, for sort of less able people. Um, but they can be on 24-7. So if you've got a festival that's running day and night, um, in the quieter periods, they can still operate those crossing points themselves like they would a normal pedestrian crossing. So they're quite common now as well. Stop go boards, so that's what it says on the tin really. Um, more dynamic control, quicker than a traffic light. Um, the, the turnaround time for, for stop go is fairly instant. So they're more useful when you, you want to do things quickly. Um, one of the main reasons we do stop go control is where we have got traffic turning right because we can't avoid that situation. Um, so well, the, the quickest and easiest way to do that is just to hold the oncoming traffic to allow them to safely turn. Um, so again, the user should remain off the carriageway if they're on the side of the road. Um, and then again, they must be suitably qualified. You have to have the same qualifications for that. Um, they're quite useful for, for pedestrian crossings, as you can see there at Rescue Day. Um, in Crow, they're, they're being used, but when we're doing pedestrian crossings, obviously they're always stop, stop, so that no one's seeing it go when people are crossing over. Um, and the downside is that they're, they're not suitable for, for use at night, and you know you are out and exposed to the elements while, while you're doing stop go. No, this is a more recent thing. Uh, CSAS, the Security Safety Accreditation Scheme. So this has been rolled out nationally now, pretty much, um, by police forces around the country. And what, what this gives us is um, we have police powers to control traffic by hand, so as if a police officer was, was there doing it. Um, it, it's very strictly regulated. Um, the uh, vetting levels are for the, similar to that of a police officer, so you know you have to be cleaner than clean really, because you're being granted police powers by the Chief Constable. Um, then the, the training course for that's a couple of days um, in, in total. Um, the, the arm waving bit's fairly straightforward, but it's more about the law um, and sort of conflict resolution um, and dealing with people who don't want to do as you're asking them. So um, that, that's a large part of the training there. Um, and also with those powers comes the, the power to require the name and address of motorists. So if somebody does fail to stop or goes through a road closure or doesn't do as you're uh, commanding them to do, um, then they're liable to prosecution, um, the same as they would if it's a police officer. So um, obviously they have that level of training as well on how to deal with people. Um, with the CSAS scheme, um, because as I sort of indicated, you are, you are stood in the road, so we, we sort of use it more as a response, um, it's a really useful response tool. So instead of having police on motorbikes, yeah, you can have private operators on motorbikes. You can respond to things, usually if they're going out, it's something we haven't planned, it's, a, it's an unknown incident that's occurred with an RTC um, or, or whatever's gone on, but they can get there very quickly and they've got the power to deal with the traffic whilst we get some traffic management crews out, sort of more permanent solutions. Um, but as I say, just a bit of care um, to be taken when, when you're risk assessing this because there, there are other proven methods of control that don't put people in the road. Um, but there, there are certain opportunities where, where it's useful, um, so it's worth considering as part of your overall package. So lane closures. I <laughs> hope. We tend to put lane closures out for two reasons, but we want to reserve that lane for something else. In this case, it's for uh, a bus queue at a park and ride site. Um, and then, or we might be using the, the lane closures to um, allow people access to and from the event. So if we want a dedicated lane where people can queue um, without affecting the running lanes, then we quite often put lane closures in for that purpose and direct people into that. Again, installed by qualified operatives with, with lane closures, anything over 40 miles an hour, the qualification 
qualifications ramp up a bit. So then you need a, a Lancia 12 A and B ticket, which is a high speed sort of motorway, dual carriageway type qualification. Um, again, through Lancia. Um, and then consideration when you're installing this should be if it's anything over 40 mile an hour, it should really have an impact protection vehicle. So you, you, the, there is a cost association with that because you start to bring sort of larger, more specialised vehicles into the mix. Um, but just a re really useful thing um, as and when it's needed. Um, and then the, the sort of last sort of lane closure, slip road closure. So um, quite often, if we have an event that's going across a dual carriageway or over a motorway, be it a cycling event or one particular example is Nebworth. Nebworth quite often needs half the roundabout closing for people to walk from Stevens Station to the site. Um, so we put slip road closures on the uh, southbound exit and northbound entry slip road on, on Stevens roundabout there. Um, and that allows people safe passage around that roundabout. Um, so that's sort of the main purpose to be used lane closures for. Road closure is a big one. Um, we close an awful lot of roads over summer. Um, for various reasons. Um, so the, the, the main reason is, is normally to control access. So if we don't want people driving through, following their sat nav, which inevitably people do now, ignore your signs and follow the sat nav, particularly those that have sort of traffic um, uh, diversions on them. So they recognise when the traffic's heavy and divert you onto side roads, but then you know you sort of feel the wrath of the local resident. Um, so we quite often close sensitive routes. Um, on, on events to make sure that people aren't using those to sort of wrap on to get through. Um, and then, you know, in combination with signs at the start of each route to say switch off your sat nav and follow our signs, please. Um, they're, they're pretty essential when you've got an event on the highway for obvious reasons. Um, that one behind there is the one sunny day I think we had at UCI this year, well cycling in Harrogate. Um, so obviously there was large portions of Harrogate which closed for nine days. Um, so we had a team of excess of 100 people out on that in various locations over those nine days to shut down that Harrogate loop. Um, so it was quite an undertaking really. Um, they have a good purpose for road closure if you, if you can get it. Um, things like Lincoln Showground, which when we've got big events, we'll close the A15 um, for, uh, for link shows for entry and exit, um, but particularly with large concerts with a sort of cliffhanger finish, we will close the road for a portion of time and it just allows a really fast exit out of the car parts, whereas traffic lights are having to give priority to, to all different users. So um, very useful if you've got a large event where you're going to struggle with exit times um, to close the road and just have a free flow out. Um, just a notice on that, so uh, any TRO that require a 12 week notice period, so it's important you sort of think about those early and get, get your applications in. Um, they do have to be advertised, and because they're advertised, it can be expensive as well. I mean, I think the average TRO costs about £1,100 um, per order, so um, but they are sort of widely used for cycling events, running events, any event that's going to take place actually physically on the highway. So, moving on, another thing that we tool that we use um, so speed restrictions and no stopping so we quite often want to get speeds down um, people can be a bit reckless particularly if we've got pedestrian crossings or any areas where we're going to be putting high volumes of cars out of gates and quite often it's just useful just to get a TRO in place to reduce that speed and just make things as safe as possible um, so again 12 weeks notice um, get, get the application in early end, there is a cost association with doing it, but if you get everything mothballed into one order, um, it's not quite so bad because you just cover the whole lot. Um, and then no stopping orders, the, these are quite widely used at events for, for obvious reasons, particularly for charging for parking, um, to prevent people sort of fly parking in the local area. That particular one there is at Durham again for, for Lumiere, um, and it just stops people parking on people's drives, getting in the way, uh, making a sort of general nuisance on themselves. Um, and, and again, counter-terrorism, um, we like to know what vehicles are where, who they belong to. Um, we order in place, and as a car, and, you know, we'll take a, a keen interest in, in why it's there. Um, so it's useful sort of counter-terrorism measures. So, talked about traffic control on the outside, and just moving on now to talk about sort of internal traffic control. Um, which is sort of equally important, I just realise I'm blasting through my time, so I'm going to shift through this. So, talk about build and break. Um, control of access is, is key to 
uh, log and control who's on site. You know, it's important that the inside's right because if you don't get it right inside, you're not getting it right outside. The, the delays are knock on. Um, so a lot of events now we're doing sort of trader escorting um, to minimise damage to uh, you know stately homes and their grass because it's very expensive to put right after. Um, and then consider sort of internal routes. Uh, speed limits, access times, um, and, and all of those things when you're planning for your internal site. Um, important bit, make sure people got the passes on and they put their phone number on there. So when, when you want the car moving, you can get hold of them. Um, that seems to happen. Um, so very quickly to talk through car parking. So about to success and the externals talked about, um, it's just make sure you have enough space. Make sure when you've calculated it, put your 10% on. You know, you, you indicate where your access points are going to be. You know that you can cope, you know you've got adequate space. Then um, it's important to get in and sort of prepare those car parks in advance, um, mowing the lines in, make sure your fire lanes are in. You get a lot more cars in when you've done the advance prep uh, than when you're just sort of free handling in the car park. Um, and allow for inclement weather, yeah, trackway on gates, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, which was, most of us dealing with car parks are all very mindful of. Um, and then, yeah, just make sure that you get that advanced parking in. Um, um, and then, yeah, so things like festivals, just make sure you thought about breakdowns. People park the cars up for four days, they come back, the battery's dead. Um, and then four by fours on site to make sure you can tow people out. Um, we sort of advocate parking charges because it reduces the number of cars on site, encourages people to share cars, you know, better for the environment. Um, and it offsets some of the cost of all the TM you have to put in to deal with the cars. If you are charging, just make sure those pay lanes are far enough in um, and then consider park and ride where it's appropriate. Um, and then just touching on different parking zones, disabled at the front, VIP, staff areas, identify them beforehand. Make sure you're parking nearest to the entry gate where they're walking in, working back through the car park so that we're not crossover of vehicles and parking. And then talk about your, you know, think about your exit strategy. How many gates, 1,100 cars an hour, remember? If you've got 10,000 cars to get out, you're going more than one gate. Nice, it's a very long wait. There, I'm blasting through the car park bit. Apologies, I've said <laughs> half an hour goes nowhere. Um, but yeah, I hope that was useful for everybody. And if anyone's got any questions for me, uh, that was great, Scott. Thanks so much. Well, look, I've had a quick chat with James and Sue who are on next, and they're willing just to wait a few minutes because there are a few questions if you don't mind. Um, but that was really, really interesting. Thank you. I got some questions, but I'm going to put those to the side and we'll answer everyone else's questions sure. uh, first. So uh, first one in was Eve Russell asked, um, what does your HVM look like? Our HVM does it look like? It is um, the cloud permeable. I'll just see if I can find a, a picture of it real quick. Um, And then perhaps why you're looking for the, that picture. Simon asked again on HVM, yep. uh, have it, do, does your HVM have any impact upon pedestrian flows, particularly relating to emergency egress? No, no, because it, uh, if, if I could just find that picture, it'd probably make it a, a little bit ah. more sense. Um, give me two seconds. Uh, Right. I mean, it, yeah, the, the, the way it's designed, um, the, the, the spikes are there, but they're covered and they're not joined together. So there's a 1.2 1, 1 metre gap between each section and the, the sections will go as wide as, as the access. So the, there's no restriction on width. It, it's all modular. So it will just keep expanding to cover the full width of what you need. Um, but certainly it's in, it's in use in Liverpool, it's in use at football grounds. You know, they're, they're big exits and the, the flows through. Um, I right. can provide some links to people. Um, I think I've seen something similar at Winter Wonderland they used. Yeah. Some. Yeah. Great. Okay. That's brilliant. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. the next question was, so if human control is not the best method, mm -hmm. then why do the largest events use CSAS? Uh, well, they, they make their own risk assessments. I mean, I... So, just did that for quite some time um, and truth be known you know the whole reason I got involved in the industry was because it was unsafe for the police to stand in the road um, for, for lots of reasons um, so the, the, my introduction into this in 96 was because the police wanted to bring their stuff out of the roads um, we don't use it as a planned form of control we, we use it as a 
response. Um, our plan, form, and control is always traffic signals, um, stop, go, TROs. Um, you know, to, to to manage. I work in highways on a day-to-day -day basis, and you know, it's a dangerous place to work is in the highway. So wherever possible, we, we don't have stuff in there. But obviously, it's up to individual events how they choose to risk assess their own control. Yeah, and I think a lot of it is probably to do with um, having the flexibility. If you've got CSAS staff, you can yeah. move them around, can't you? Um, yeah, well, we, we've got both. Um, that, that, that's what we've done. We've done CSAS, we've done the training. Um, we, we, we have both options available to us. Um, so whether it's to you know, normal control methods that we use day to day or, or CSAS, I think it was just having that sort of joint approach, which is why we went, went down the road with CSAS. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Makes sense. Uh, I know the answer to this, but I'll leave this one with you. Are CSAS operatives only deployed within a TTRO boundary? No. No, they, uh, they have the power to control. It's, it's per, per police area, so um, we, we have CSAS in North Yorkshire, so we are entitled to employ that control um, uh, anywhere in North Yorkshire um, at any given point. So um, we, we employ CSAS wherever they're required. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, and I've used CSAS. They're just they're quite helpful on uh, on junctions and things like that, aren't they? Uh, right. Oh, next one is: Is there a version of the CSAS in the Republic of Ireland? To your knowledge, not that I'm aware of. Um, uh, in, in Scotland, it's not. Um, so, so I need to check that. But um, as far as I'm aware, I mean, the police are still doing control in Scotland um, at, at events. So. They, they haven't completely stepped away from that role. Certainly, when I do the um, the, the East Fortune Air Show, they they still very much have a police-led um, traffic management scheme. Yeah, great. Well, that was the next question was Scotland, so we've we've covered that. Uh, so that's good. So next one was, uh, how much space should be left for an average-sized car to park, including manoeuvring space, etc., if we are trying to ballpark capacity in an area? Uh, well, we, we work at one, 175 per acre. If I've got a flat open field, yeah, that, that, that's, you know, like a showground, um, where I know we've got maximum capacity, there's no trees in the way, it's all reasonably, you know, well laid out, well drained, then we work at 175 per acre. Um, but, um, yeah, we, 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 we sort of pace that out. There's not, there's not a precise figure because cars are all, all different sizes now, but invariably when, when we pace out, um, 50 paces is approximately 50 cars in a double. Um, so that, that's how we work. And then we drop back to the next line, drop back to the next line, and start at the front and, and work back, really. But yeah, it can drop as low as sort of 150 cars an acre if you park in a site like Camp Best or something. Um, and, yeah, yeah. So with that, is that including la uh, lanes and everything? That's if you yeah. just looked at an acre, you could, I could put 175 cars in there, yeah. including access. Yeah. That, that, that's you know, statistically, if I was to take an aerial shot, it would be the average yeah. 175 cars per acre. Cool. Okay. That's really useful. I'm sure that's going to be a, uh, I use a slightly lower number, oddly enough, yeah. but that's just, uh, but I think any sort of number, I've, you do use about between 150. Um, yeah, yeah. So yours is 150, 175. Yeah, yeah. I think that's one of those things that people can take away. And if they're doing quick calculations, they can just apply yeah. it really quickly. So yeah. that's a, a really useful little nugget there. Um, so Scott has asked, I'm assuming not the same Scott, <laughs> that would be a bit weird, mate. Uh, he's asked, where does the organiser's responsibility for public highways end and start? Uh, what should an organiser consider, for example, from access, egress, right up to local roadworks? Also, who, well, there's lots of questions here, so answer that first bit. Yeah, um, so um, th th there's no fixed line. Um, and, and this argument rumbles on about where, where does my responsibility end, you know, it ends at a point where um, it's a judgment call, um, it depends on the sort of event and the type of event, where it is, is it in the city centre, if it is in the city centre, you, you know, uh, once people are sort of bust away from site and they're within, within the realms of I'd say, um, you know, until such point as people can get on a bus or a train or a taxi or whatever's available to them, but there's certainly a duty of care, um, and, it, and it varies so much by event and by site, and you just have to sort of make that judgment call on, on the day, but there's certainly been a lot of debate at certain events about where the, the, the expense, really, of, of traffic management should end. 
And I think from my experience with, in terms of uh, understanding what local roadworks is going on, that's done with streetworks, isn't it? And it is streetworks registered. Um, so uh, if you go to roadworks.org, um, you can see on there all the planned works. Um, most highways authorities are signed up to it now. Um, so we've, we've put our planning applications in for our events in January for, for strategic road network because we want to book that road space early so there's no conflict between our works because once we put the road space, it's not available to anybody else. Um, so you just want to, especially with Highways England, get those in as early as you can um, because you, you know that road space gets booked up with, with works and other events and science so the earlier you can get it in and make sure you've got no conflict between them. Great, great. And then the last question from Scott was, uh, who would be responsible for local parking restrictions, the organiser or the local authority highways unit? Okay, so the, um, the responsibility would uh, like normally lie with the um, local authority, the enforcement, the, um, the signage and the cones and the putting in of the traffic regulation order would normally lie with us. So we'd apply for the order. Um, so we put the no waiting cones out, put tailway zone signs on entry and exit at strategic points. Um, but ultimately, it's down to the local authority to enforce that. Um, and as we all know, budget constraints, it, it's rarely done. Um, police can enforce it as, if they're causing an obstruction, as they would on any given day. They'd call their rotor garage out and remove the vehicle. But they wouldn't ordinarily enforce it in advance down to the local authority because they're granting the order. So, um, you know, at best, they'll probably get a parking ticket. All right, look, three more questions we'll whip through really quickly and then we better get on to the next session. But um, Alan uh, Fitzpatrick was just asking, are you using drones for real-time monitoring of traffic these days? Well, we can. I, I bought a drone. We've done the training. Um, try finding a site you can fly it at um, because by its very nature, events uh, are, are no drone areas as a, as a rule of thumb. Um, there, there are exceptions. I'd like to use it a lot more. Um, but again... It, it, it's restrictions at events you, you just can't fly them um, because of numbers of people so the the drone um laws have changed or will be changing uh beginning of july so there are and and what part of that will be in fact is allowing some new drones that will be uh, regulated because they'll have different controls and yeah. will actually be able to get much closer to right. um to large large uh, assemblies of people and uh, and structures and things Mm -hmm. um, but you can learn a little bit more about that. There's, uh, there's, a, there's a great company called UAV Hub, which has got all that information. Right. Definitely worth a look at that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so quickly then, so, uh, so Northern Ireland, is there a CSAS for Northern Ireland, do you know? Is that uh, not, not I'm aware of. I've been out to uh, Belfast quite recently on uh, event planning for the last two years, actually, um, and it's, it's never come up in any of our conversations. So as far as I'm aware, um, CSAS, but don't, don't quote me on that, I'd have to double check. But mm. uh, certainly it hasn't been mentioned as part of our plans for, for that particular event. No, no, interesting. So last question, how do you estimate the impact of wet weather? on greenfield sites, on, uh, particularly on vehicle exit times? Yeah, um, just knowledge and experience more than anything else. We allow that 10% margin. We obviously talk to event organisers um, and like to yourselves when we're, pl when we're planning this, make sure that there's adequate trackway and if, they, if you know, that they've got the provision, if it's not on site, that, that they can get it in if it's needed. Um, Trackway, as we all know, costs an absolute fortune. Um, so, you know, people tend to try and leave it as late as possible to really know what the weather's going to be. But again, it gets booked up, so it's just making sure that people are planned in. Um, it, effect on exit times, it depends how muddy it is. Um, with a lot of events, they come in, they park up, and then they don't move again for four days. So, the, the least trafficked areas are where they park, so that's not too bad. It tends to be gates roadways but we can move roadways around in the field because they're just mowing in so it's quite easy to flip a roadway um, and, and sort of be quite dynamic but no doubt about it probably the worst event I've ever been involved in terms of wet weather was was the festival yeah that looked tough horrendously wet it was a, yeah it was a tough year <laughs> yeah I bet I bet all right, well, look, we better go and get on with the next one. Thanks so much. That was really, yeah, that was absolutely brilliant. Um, there's one more question in Q&A if you just want to hop on that after yeah, you've, sure. um, you've closed down. If you want to stop your sharing and then yeah. I can 
do the intro um, and if we mute you and turn your video off. But thanks so much, Scott. That was brilliant. We'll uh, catch up soon, buddy. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks very much.